One of the first questions that you might ask yourself when you open these New Testament documents is, what kind of documents do you actually have? So if you start reading epistles, you will notice that some of them are very personal letters aimed primarily at individuals. For example, Titus, Timothy, Philemon, and so on. Some others are letters for wider communities like Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, and so on. Although in the personal letters, there are topics that were recognized as very useful for wider community as well. And they have probably been read out uh, out loud in churches. For example, we read in Colossians uh, 4.16 that Paul asked if that letter could be read in Laodicea and then for Laodicean letter, which we don't have, to be read in Colossae. From this, we can see that these letters, even though written for particular communities, have found its influence in wider Christian circle as well. These letters contain closer, more personal view on life of churches in certain geographical areas, issues that they have faced, practices and beliefs that they have had, and we are even introduced to certain individuals that were significant for the church, either on the positive or even on the negative side. On the other hand, if you start reading Book of Acts, that book is different from Epistles and it is more of a historical biography. And this book shows the development of the early church and it provides a broader perspective on the first 30 years of Christian church. And we have to emphasize something that Book of Acts described development of the church in eastern and northeastern part of the Mediterranean Sea, which is in a way a limited edition of the Christian mission. Since we know that the gospel had most likely at that time reached also parts of Africa and Asia, but sadly we don't have information about that development in the book of Acts. However, these documents, when we put them together, Acts and Epistles, and we are going to focus mostly on Paul's Epistles, they together create something of a historical narrative. A story about community, or even better to say, about communities. And they're sharing one basic idea. And that idea is that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And this community is finding a fresh way to interpret what does that mean in this world where they're living? How does that idea reshape the entire worldview and how to live now? This historical narrative reveals a very creative and a very courageous movement that was striving to fulfill the calling that Jesus entrusted them with. And this calling, in a way, had two challenges. One is external challenge, and that is to preach the gospel to the world. But while doing that, they had to sort out a lot of things amongst themselves as a community, and that was internal challenge. In a way, to refine what, is, what does that mean now to be the people of God. And this is one of the core ideas why I believe that studying Acts and Epistles is one of the key things for Christians to do today. And that is to learn how to relate and minister to the world that doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord, but also to learn how to relate and minister to that odd fellow sitting next to you in the church that believes also that Jesus Christ is the Lord, but they are probably doing that in some different way that, than you might do it. But there is also a third important element in this for you to explore. And that is, how could you, in a better, more refreshing way, rediscover who God is to you and how could this whole story make sense in your life? So, we are starting with the idea that we are stepping into this historical narrative. So let me say a few things about this historical side. Reading the book of Acts, you have probably encountered a lot of names, events, and places. And by reading that, you can notice that Acts is a very historical book. But what is important for us is also to emphasize that it covers the period of first 30 plus years of the early Christian church. Now, Luke, 
is very much interested to show certain events, individuals, things that are going to provide a lot of historical background. So he starts his report with the time of Christ's ascension. This event probably took place in AD 31. Even though that there is some discussion about the precise year of Christ's death and resurrection, 31 AD is generally good reference point. We know that Christ was crucified at Passover, which takes place in spring. And we know that according to the Acts chapter 1 verse 3, Christ's ascension took place 40 days after the crucifixion. So events described in the chapter 1 most likely start with AD 31 in spring. And then if you read on and you come to the end of the book of Acts, uh, those events are pro probably taking place sometime around AD 64. Paul is in Rome after his three missionary trips and his arrest in Jerusalem, but now we don't have any indication of the very impo important event, and that is persecution by Nero that took place in AD 64. That's why it's a good suggestion that the last report in the book took place sometime between 62 and 64 AD, and we could potentially say that 62 is a likely date. This means that Acts covered the events that took place between AD 31 and probably AD 62. It is also very important to note that in the book of Acts, we have several individuals and events that provide us with a good evidence that historically, Luke knows what he is talking about and in a way he is building his credibility on that as well. So, um, one of the individuals that is mentioned is Caiaphas in Acts chapter 4 and we know that he was not high priest anymore uh, by the AD 36. Then we have the uh, death of King Herod uh, Agrippa in AD 44. Then we have famine also that was prophesied in Acts chapter 11 taking place around uh, 46 and 47 AD. Gamaliel dying around the year 50. Uh, then we have uh, expulsion of Jews from Rome uh, between 49 and uh, 54 AD, Festus replace, replacing Felix around AD 60, and so on. So all these individuals and events uh, are confirmed also from external sources, external history, and there are many others. So during these 30 years, we have development of the first apostolic church in Jerusalem, start of persecution by Jews in Judea, expansion of mission outside of the Ju uh, Judea to the Gentiles, persecution by Gentiles, then we also can identify some of the core Christian beliefs during that time, development of the early church structure and pastoral care for the churches. We have a lot. And in a way to, to, to describe this, Acts will give you an overview of the situation in the early Christian church in Mediterranean. Uh, it is a broad and big picture of the churches on various geographical areas and in various times. So Luke sometimes spends more time on certain events, giving us more insight into particular situations. But in general, we don't have a lot of description of the life of local churches in Acts. The most that we get is about Jerusalem church in first few chapter, uh, chapters uh, during the first few years of Christianity. But simultaneously, you should be able to read most of the epistles, especially Paul's epistles, since probably all of them were written during the time between 49 and 64 AD. And as you might notice, that is the time that the book of Acts mostly covers. Epistles will give you much more information about local situations with significant theological and social insight into topics and issues that were of value for early Christians. In a way, we could say that Acts give you these big spectacles to see the big picture. And epistles might uh, be used as a magnifying glass to see more details in the picture. So just to provide one of the examples, um, church in Corinth. So in Acts chapter 18, you're going to read about the story how Paul came to Corinth, started preaching, had some trouble, stayed there for a year and a half and considerable amount of time, depending on which verse you read, and the Corinthian church was started. 
But we don't learn a lot about church in Corinth from Acts. That's why we have 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And those epistles are going to reveal much more information about the issues uh, in that church, beliefs that they had, uh, that, that they had to emphasize and uh, resolve, relationship between Paul and uh, members over there, and so on. So when you start reading 1st Corinthians, you're faced with this community that is divided, has some serious moral issues, they are trying to figure out how to live as Christians and keep some ties to the world around them also, and so on. They, they had a lot of issues. And you don't read about that in Acts. But also, in Paul's epistles, you don't get the story of how the Corinthian church was started, as you will get it in Acts chapter 18. So, this whole story is shared between Acts and epistles, and it works for the wider Christian community during that time. And this brings us to the second part of, of this historical narrative, and this is a narrative side of the New Testament documents. You can see this especially in the book of Acts. The book starts with Jesus' speech to the disciples, and the key verse that outlines the structure of the book is in chapter 1, verse 8. And it says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The book shows how the story is going to develop, and it is giving us this kind of a structure. So, first part is, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. These words were fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, only 10 days after Christ's ascension. And the baptism by the Holy Spirit is one of the key identifiers of disciples as you're going to see uh, reading the book. And not just that, but everything that the disciples were doing was marked by the presence of the Spirit. So by saying this, Christ puts uh, the Christian mission into perspective. The presence of the Holy Spirit is the key for the Christian mission. Now when you read that verse, you'll see the second part that is important also, and that is that you will be my witnesses. And this word is one of the key signifiers of disciples' identity. Throughout the book, you'll be able to see the story of how uh, disciples were faithful, to, uh, how they were faithful witnesses of the gospel in many different circumstances. Thus, by being faithful witnesses, they were fulfilling Christ's words. This is one of the major themes. And then the third part that uh, described in the verse is geographical progression. Luke quotes Jesus' words that witnessing will take place in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. As you read the book of Acts, you will notice that Luke actually follows this geographical progression. So in Acts chapters 2 to chapter 7, he covers the mission in Jerusalem. Then from Acts chapter 8 to the first part of chapter 11, it covers the mission throughout Judea and Samaria. And then second part of chapter 11, until the end of the book, Luke covers the mission throughout the Mediterranean world all the way to Rome. Um, even though the gospel was reaching many areas not mentioned in the book of Acts, we believe that Luke's purpose in writing Acts was to show that gospel has reached the center of the known world. And once it's there, we have, in a way, a pinnacle of success of Christian witness. Now when it has reached Rome, it doesn't have any other limits in a way. So the book of Acts is a narrative of fulfillment of Jesus' words, introduced to us in chapter 1. And this narrative shows the following. Christ gave a promise and then it shows how Christ is faithful in fulfilling His promise through His disciples by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then we are noticing that the disciples are faithful in living according to that identity that Christ gave them. And that is identity of a witness in fulfilling Christ's promise. That means when you start reading Acts and Epistles, especially at that early stage, first 30 years, you will discover both the history people, places, events, beliefs, and so on, and the narrative, 
how the story relates to everything so far from the Old Testament story of Israel, then that time during the Second Temple of Judaism or intertestamental period, then when Christ came, and now when the uh, promises are fulfilled, how are we now living when we know that Jesus Christ is the Lord? So to conclude this session, I will share with you my definition of how I understand the Acts and Epistles and its story. It is a story about a community which had recognized that something transforming took place in the person of Jesus Christ. And that has shaped the history of the whole cosmos and every individual whose destiny depends on their response to the Lord Jesus Christ.